Here's the prayer for listening hearts and minds. Holy One, you speak to us in so many wondrous ways. Speak to our hearts now as scripture is read that we might hear your wisdom and embrace your love and leading. Amen. The first scripture reading today is Psalm 20. Let us listen together for God's leading. The Lord answer you in the day of trouble. The name of the God of Jacob protect you. May he send you help from the sanctuary and give you support from Zion. May he remember all your offerings and regard with favor your burnt sacrifices. May he grant you your heart's desire and fulfill all your plans. May we shout for joy over your victory. And in the name of our God, set up our banners. May the Lord fulfill all your petitions. Now I know that the Lord will help his anointed. He will answer him from his holy heaven with mighty victories by his right hand. Some take pride in chariots and some in horses, but our pride is in the name of the Lord our God. They will collapse and fall, but we shall rise and stand upright. Give victory to the king, O Lord. Answer us when we call. Friends, good morning. It is a joy and a privilege to be with you all in worship this morning, children and adults alike. I am delighted to be with those of y'all who are in the room and those of you who are joining us on Zoom as I point to the TV, which is not actually where you all are. You're there. Hi, friends. Um, it is just my delight to be with you all. I am grateful to Kendra for the invitation. Um, send her away on vacation as often as you would like and invite me to come back because I'm glad to be here. Uh, my name is Libby Shannon. I serve as Transitional Executive Presbyter for the Presbytery of the Twin Cities area, uh, a role I have been in almost two years. And I have to tell you, I'm still not a thousand percent sure what it means. Um, but the part I know is that I get to be with folks around Minnesota and parts of Wisconsin. Um, on Sunday mornings, I get to join with their session meetings, I get to go to worship, I get to preach with them, I get to teach Sunday school classes, and I get to serve as a resource across the presbytery. It is, um, it's really, really fun, honestly. Uh, you know, I'm not sure that when I started seminary, I thought, a presbytery exec, that is what God is calling me to do. But it turns out I was wrong. And it has been an absolute joy to be in this role for the last couple of years and to continue to be in this role for the foreseeable future. Uh, so I bring you greetings on behalf of the 55-ish congregations across the Presbytery of the Twin Cities area, those who are gathering for worship this morning um, all over. I also bring you greetings on behalf of our partner at McAllister College and our partner up at Clearwater Forest Camp and the mission partners around the Presbytery who gather uh, in a variety of ways to do justice and to seek mercy and to walk humbly with God. So thank you for having me. Will you join with me in a word of prayer? God of all times and all places, be with us in this time and this space. Quiet in us any voice but your own that we might hear the words you speak to us today. Amen. Our second reading comes from Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, chapter 5, verses 6 through 17. Listen now for what the Spirit is saying to us the church. So we are always confident, even though we know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Yes, we do have confidence, and we would rather be away from the body and at home in the Lord. So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please him. For all of us must appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each may receive recompense for what has been done in the body, whether good or evil. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we try to persuade others. 
but ourselves are well known to God. And I hope we are also well known to your consciences. We are not commending ourselves to you again, but giving you an opportunity to boast about us so that you may be able to answer those who boast in outward appearance and not in heart. For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ urges us on because we are convinced that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all so that those who live might love, might know, those who live might live no longer for themselves, but for him who died and was raised for them. From now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view, even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view, we know him no longer that way. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I grew up a camp kid. I want to be perfectly clear, not a camping kid. I do not come from a family that relishes in loading up tents and coolers and sleeping bags for a few nights of laying on the ground. <laughs> Rather, I grew up a camp kid. To be more specific, a church camp kid, a Presbyterian church camp kid. <clears throat> not unlike Clearwater Forest here in the Senate of Lakes and Prairies, the camp of my childhood, called Cedar Kirk, sits east of Tampa, Florida, nestled among the banks of the Alafaya River, river being a generous description of what, it, what is found there. But that Cedar Kirk, that is the place that formed me. It formed my faith, it formed my personality, it continues to form my friendships. It is still the place I most consistently feel at rest. Pulling onto the driveway at 1920 Streetman Drive, dripping with Spanish moss from the live oaks, I feel my lungs expand a bit deeper, my stomach unclench a little bit more, my heart rate and blood pressure drop just a few ticks. On hot Florida summer nights, it gets dark at camp. When you're eight or nine or ten, it's really dark at camp. The kind of dark that makes armadillos sound like sasquatches and burrowing owls sound like velociraptors. The kind of dark that causes tree roots to leap out of the ground and take down unsuspecting campers and staff alike. It's the kind of dark that causes paths that once were straight to suddenly be winding and disorienting especially to this 10-year-old who always, always forgot her flashlight. I wish I remember who gave me the advice. I know it's been passed around for generations at camp and probably many camps, but someone finally told me the trick to walking through the woods at night was to stop looking down, desperately trying to see the obstacles, to stop looking for the pitfalls, and instead to look up. The break between the trees would help me know where the path went so I wouldn't become disoriented. By not trying so hard to see where the tree roots were, I would naturally pick my feet up a little higher and be less likely to trip. I'm quite certain when Paul says we walk by faith, not by sight, in our text this morning, this is not what he had in mind. But I can't help but think about the ways that that shift in focus literally changed my ability to safely navigate the world around me and what that could mean in our lives of faith today. It's a bit of a strange passage. Grammatically, it is tough to follow. It's not really a melodious turn of phrase or a compelling parable. Second Corinthians 5 will not be showing up in any of our coloring pages anytime soon. And yet, through it all, Paul places before the Corinthians and us an invitation to follow the way of Christ, 
that not only challenged the status quo within his own community, but continues to press us to think differently about our own community. He calls on us to reorient how we think about this life of faith today, how we think about life eternal, and how we're called to walk through a world filled with roots trying to trip us up and darkness that distracts and befuddles us. Throughout the writings of Paul, we see a push and pull of insider and outsider tensions. Paul's outsiderness in conflict with the insiderness of those within Jewish communities of the early church. The outsiderness of other Gentiles versus the insiderness of communities closer to the lineage of the disciples. But in as clear a terms as possible, our text today puts that argument of insider or outsider to rest. For the love of Christ urges us on because we are convinced that one has died for all. Therefore, all have died, and he died for all. That's it. That's the whole theological statement. As generations of theologians and clergy and self-righteous windbags have debated who's in and who's out, typically to conveniently align with their own preconceptions, prejudices, and bigotries, Paul offers us a rare, clear claim. He died for all. Or in the language of my people, he died for all y'all. I have to confess, even as a professional person of faith, it doesn't always come easy to me. Even with that kind of clear statement, I struggle with the brokenness of this world. I sometimes struggle to ground myself in this institution that so often seems more interested and invested in its own self-preservation than in the transformation of itself and its community. On the days, it's especially hard. On days filled with grief and anger and disappointment, I come back to the same place. The first line of the brief statement of faith, the confession that was written in 1983 to honor the formation of the Presbyterian Church USA. It simply says, in life and in death, we belong to God. I come back to this claim over and over and over again for a couple of reasons. One, I need it. I need to know that I, Elizabeth Hunter Shannon, child of the covenant, belong to God. Even and especially on the days when I'm not so sure or not so deserving or kind of a jerk. And two, it is a stark reminder that if number one is true and I belong to God, then you, y'all, all y'all, also belong to God. I don't get to decide who's in and who's out. I don't get to whisper into Jesus' ear at the judgment seat. I don't get to choose. And that accomplishes two things in my life. It frees me to try and let go of my judgment of others, try and let go of my judgment of others. And it compels me to remember that Jesus loves the people I find annoying just as much as he loves me. Maybe more some days. In our passage this morning, Paul is offering us an opportunity to be reconciled to one another just as we are reconciled to the very Christ who died for all. This reconciliation is not an individual endeavor. It's not reserved for particular special ones in their personal and private life. It's not reserved for the ones who get it right every day or the ones who don't slip up. It's not just for, reserved for the ones who have the best church attendance or volunteer the most. It's not reserved for those who were baptized as in infants or reserved for those who made public pro proclamations of faith. It's not reserved for those who suffered the most or the least. Rather, this gift of reconciliation is available 
freely, joyfully, abundantly for all. The real struggle, of course, comes when we realize that reconciliation, freedom in Christ, this new creation, is actually really, really, really hard. (laughs) As progressive-ish mainline Protestants, we can usually agree that reconciliation, redemption, and transformation are hard. But in almost every instance, the part that's hard is entirely about the ways other people need reconciling, redemption, and transformation. We are so good. We are so good at seeing the injustices around us. We're good at naming oppressive systems and structures. We're good at decrying powers and principalities. We are good at naming what those people need to do to be transformed by the love of Jesus Christ. (laughs) We are terrible at placing ourselves in the midst of that mess. We are terrible at naming and coming to terms with the ways that we too, me, I, am in need of reconciling, redemption, and transformation. For as long as I can remember, I have had an activist streak. I blame my mother. That's what she's for, right? She's watching, hi mama. I remember as a little girl being mad about some sort of injustice in the newspaper and her passing remark, I'm sure mostly to get me out of her hair, was write a letter to the editor. And so I did. And it only grew. Letters, phone calls, emails, protests, boycotts, sit-ins, fasts, nonviolent actions. My life has been marked by believing that part of what I am called to do as a Christian is engage in the transformation of the world. I'm honored and proud to have shown up in my personal life around the things I believe in and also in my professional life, standing alongside the church for things that matter. While I have developed an extensive resume of telling other people how to be transformed and reconciled, I've also managed to do a pretty good job of ignoring my own need to be transformed and reconciled and redeemed. I failed at living into my own new creation. Failed at doing the hard internal work that asks me to let go of those things that continue to perpetuate sin and brokenness in my life and in the world around me to let go of my own tendencies to be a self-righteous windbag. Paul's invitation to walk by faith and not by sight is one that frees us to look beyond the ways we're wanting other people to change and examine the ways we're needing to let go, include, or make space for a new way of being in our own lives. That freedom comes from the radical inclusivity of it, It comes from the reminder that there's no standard to live up to before we're allowed to be reconciled. There's no benchmark that grants us permission to be loved. There's no heavenly sticker chart that makes us worthy. Rather, when we are assured that he has died for all, and we therefore no longer need to live just for ourselves, we are liberated, we are freed to live into this new creation, assured that everything old has passed away and everything has become new. I think a lot about those dark camp paths, in part out of nostalgia. I really love being there and I miss it. But mostly because I think about what a terrifying thing it was to do the exact opposite of what I was sure I was supposed to do. Instead of intently staring down at the ground, trying to anticipate or remember the obstacles in my way, I needed to throw that obvious instinct out the proverbial window and instead look up. Letting the tree breaks guide me, letting the goodness of God's creation show me the way. Walking by faith, not by sight. We are living in a season in which the paths are dark and the obstacles are many. 
white supremacy continues to infect even our most sacred spaces. Homophobia, patriarchy, and xenophobia are as socially acceptable as ever. It's so easy to point to the ways that those diseases infect others and say they need to be reconciled to Christ. They need to be redeemed. They need to be transformed. But I find myself in a position of authority and power in a nearly exclusively white denomination, and I have to wonder, what are the ways that I perpetuate that racism? What are the ways I benefit from that privilege? What are the ways my education, denominational connections, and insiderness have made me blind to the ways this denomination tries to bypass the claim that Christ died for all? And when I come face to face with the chance to either keep staring at the ground in the hopes that I'll find the way or taking a chance to look up, am I courageous enough, bold enough, confident enough to look to the heavens for the path. In life and in death and in the darkness of a summer night, we belong to God. In winding paths and deep trauma and divisive oppression and alienating systems, we belong to God. In a new creation and when the old life has passed away, we belong to God. Me. You, y'all, all y'all, we belong to God. Thanks be.